Hello, my name is Colin Coyne, and as Executive Director of Meta Global, on behalf of all of my colleagues, we'd like to welcome you to this important and timely video presentation. Meta Global is a global education service provider that seeks to connect practitioners, educators, and institutions to deliver a transformative model of healthcare education. We seek to improve the outcomes of populations by providing access to globally renowned faculty in a way that addresses present and future needs and through the lens of competency, character, and caring. The series you're going to view today addresses the essential topic of cardiac complications from COVID-19. The series is divided into six parts, which can be viewed individually or consecutively as one seminar. We'd like to thank our partners at Brookwood Medical Health Systems and Dr. Farrell Mendelson for providing access to this content. We hope that it adds to your practice. We hope you enjoy the presentations and we particularly wish you continued good health. Hello, I'm Dr. Donald Lloyd-Jones, president of the American Heart Association for 2021 to 22. I'm also the chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. This presentation from the Cardiology PC Group in Birmingham, Alabama, on the CVD impact of COVID-19 should be very useful to you in your practice. I am so pleased that my former colleague from residency, Dr. Farrell Mendelson, was able to organize this series of presentations for your benefit. All the best to you and others in Asia as you continue to manage the COVID pandemic and the growing epidemic of cardiovascular disease. Enjoy the meetings. Um, before we even get into the COVID piece of this, the first question is what is myocarditis in and of itself? First of all, it's a pretty uncommon condition, but we do see it from time to time and it's become much more uh, of a hot topic with COVID. Uh, the biggest thing to know and just to kind of direct your attention is about the lymphocytic myocardial infiltration. Um, so um, that's kind of the, the hallmark of, of making the diagnosis is the lymphocytic infiltration that you see. So to that end, the best way to uh, diagnose it is with myocardial bi endomyocardial biopsy, which is almost never done anymore. Um, I, when I was a fellow, we did it routinely for uh, heart uh, transplant patients for rejection, but I haven't done it since I was a fellow, and I've been out of practice almost 18 years now. So long story short, that's, that's, that's the gold standard, but um, we have to use other modalities to help make the diagnosis, which we'll talk about in much more detail during the talk. Um, the other thing to know about myocarditis is that it often results in acute heart failures and misrepresentations. However, just like anything in clinical medicine, there's no black and white a lot of times, so there's a lot of gray within this. So, um, And this is just kind of a, a, a myocardial biopsy slide uh, showing um, the, the large amounts of uh, lymphocytic infiltration, the little small purple on the left particularly shows you that large white blood cell um, infiltration into the myocardium. So one of the, uh, within this, and this is when this first came up, you know, people were, were so fear-based about myocarditis because of what was going on um, around the country. So originally, I'm a big baseball fan, so um, I remember this dis distinctly. Um, this pitcher was was a sideline for the whole season for COVID myocarditis. I believe I should know the baseball team, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Maybe in the Cleveland Indians. But long story short, um, had a um, MRI that that revealed myocarditis and that kind of sideline, and that kind of pitched this into a little bit of a frenzy. Um, and so some registries that were, oh, gosh, this thing is sensitive. Um, go back. Um, um, some registries uh, reported up to 78% involvement uh, with COVID patients. Uh, that then led to a German study uh, further down here um, that showed 22% of patients post-COVID had myocarditis. Finally, this led to another autopsy uh, study of 216 patients, which was a multi, 
multinational registry and 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 obviously you're at necropsy you're looking at the myocardium and they showed only about four and a half percent involvement with lymphocytic infiltration remember i told you the way you diagnose myocarditis is not because hey they they have these symptoms but it's truly with tissue and the tissue only showed four and a half percent infiltration of the lymphocytes um, but, and this is where it really gets challenging is, and this is as us as clinicians, is the subclinical symptoms make it difficult to assess. I mean, how, how involved is it or how not involved is it? That's where you, it comes into to play where you have to use your expertise and training uh, through, throughout this. So some of the, some of the uh, complaints with myocarditis, um, somebody's gonna walk in and say, hey, doc, I have myocarditis. I'm like, hey, what are the things that people complain about? And they're obvious, but nonetheless are important to mention. Um, people will complain of angina. Um, they'll have palpitations and syncope or near syncope, as uh, Dr. Hanna was just alluding to in his talk. Uh, they'll be short of breath, they'll have a cough, they'll have fever, and, and obviously general malaise is probably thrown into that as well. Um, this is kind of a, a cool slide, maybe hard to see and project. I, I just thought it was cool because it shows you, these are all the pandemics that have ever occurred. <laughs> um, and it's kind of a nice colorful slide, but if you look carefully um, back at the Black Plague, 200 million people died, um, whereas you've got COVID here, and this data is way, way old, um, but, but it, the point is that the small size denotes the number of patients that are affected. Now, uh, Dr. Hanna mentioned that over 500,000 people have died in the United States with it, so this number is not nearly as accurate as it was, um, it, as what's shown in, in the slide. But the point is that even something like HIV or the Spanish flu, if you look at that in terms of the actual uh, number of patients affected, uh, I mean, we're still early in this and we have vaccines now, so I suspect this will never become like a big green or red or, or purple ball like we see on the, in the, the background. Let's hope not, but anyway, um, I think this kind of puts it into perspective. Um, so with the, the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, virus, there's lots of things that can happen. Uh, obviously, you can get hypoxic, you can get septic, you can have systemic inflammation stress cardiomyopathy, which we'll talk about, and then of course myocarditis, which is why I'm talking, and then type one myocardial infarctions. I'm an interventional guy, um, and you know it's, it's something we get called to the cath lab urgently for when people have this, and, and to my knowledge, I've only known of two cases um, that were in STEMIs where they were subtotally occluded vessels um, since, since we've been dealing with COVID here at Princeton. There may be more, and some of the other guys may have mentioned that in their talks, but in, as far as I can, can remember in terms of correlation, this is the only time I've seen it is twice with where we've had to go in and do PCI urgently. But the point is, is that all of these events, all of them cause troponin elevation. So I'm sorry, this slides are so sensitive, but some of the signs that you'll see with COVID myocarditis is jugular venous distension, you'll have lower extremity edema, your pulse pressure is narrow, and that has to do a lot of the times due to the, what's going on with your systemic vascular resistance. Um, you'll have cold mottled extremities, which also suggests that your SVR is high, your, your tachycardic, and then interestingly, right upper quadrant pain. And so the thought about that is, is that oftentimes people will have acute right heart failure, which will then cause congestion in the liver um, in that capsule uh, and cause right upper quadrant pain. Uh, so some, some of the clinical manifestations are obvious, but nonetheless are, are important to mention is that you'll have acute heart failure with a result of, result of a pulmonary edema, um, or you could have significant uh, lower extremity edema and abdominal girth and, and swelling uh, from right heart failure. You can have an acute coronary syndrome, which we talked about a minute ago, arrhythmias, which Dr. Hanna just spoke about, and then overt shock, which is uh, um, the, the biggest, uh, uh, the, the most common thing we'll see um, a lot of times. This kind of slide just enhances some of this. So the things that we mentioned before where people come in with NSTEMIs or STEMIs, and this is thought to be due to the prothrombotic effect from the pro-inflammatory effect that we see. You can have new onset heart failure uh, in the absence of coronary disease. 
uh, chronic heart failure, and this is the one that really is really interesting to me, is people that may have had heart failure before, how to tease out is this related in any way to uh, what's going on with an acute infection with COVID. And then finally, uh, people are, are in overt shock, and that's that doesn't require uh, you know, having advanced medical degrees to, to figure out who's, who's in overt shock. Um, but the one thing it is difficult is to know is it your purely septic shock or is it cardiogenic shock? So this is fascinating to me. And um, uh, when we've looked at, there's not a lot of cases with COVID myocarditis and I'll share that data with you in a minute, but the point being that it's actually more common in men who are middle-aged without a lot of medical problems. Uh, hypertension was the most common com comorbid condition. So <laughs> I, let, I read that slide and I go, hey guys, that's, that's me. <laughs> I'm 52, I'm a guy, um, I don't have any medical problems, thank God. And um, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that can be uh, quite, uh, um, uh, you know, can, can affect some of the healthy. Um, I know a lot of the other talks were discussing about comorbid conditions. Well, myocarditis is not that, um, which is, fascinating to me. Most, most people would intuitively think it's the people that are, you know, uh, chronically in the hospital with heart failure or coronary disease or both, um, but actually it's not the case. So uh, it's really quite interesting. Some of the ECG findings that we see in myocarditis, again, Dr. Hannah talked about some of this. Um, sinus tachycardia is the most common thing we'll see. You can have some nonspecific STT changes. Um, of course, ventricular tachycardia or PVCs can occur. You can have ST segment elevation in up to five to 10% of patients. We didn't, haven't seen that here at Princeton, but that does seem to be the case in, your, in, in some of the registries. You can have low QRS voltage, and the thought behind that, and this is what we'll talk about in a little more detail later, is that you can have myocardial edema acutely occur, and that, and that can lower your voltage. Uh, you can then have high-grade AV block and then, of course, in, increased QT intervals. And so some of that may be uh, pharmacologically induced from some of the drugs we use, so you have to keep that in mind. Again, that was something that uh, Dr. Hanna had mentioned as well. Um, just to kind of go into mechanistically what's going on with the arrhythmias, I'm a mechanism guy. I like to really think about what's going on behind the scenes. So the, here's what's going on. <sighs> okay. I'll try and be as gentle as I can with this guy. Uh, so cardiomyocyte injury uh, can occur, and that, this seems to be more of a direct injury of the virus straight to the myocardium, um, and it can go via the ACE2 receptor, which was also mentioned earlier. Um, that can cause acute arrhythmias, particularly supraventricular arrhythmias like AFib or SVT, PACs, atrial tachycardia, that sort of thing. You can then have pericardial inflammation, um, and that uh, can cause uh, just generalized irritation in the epicardium. Then you can have microvascular ischemia, and that's due to vascular leakage. And then finally, and this is actually a little more interesting, is uh, once you have your, quote, cytokine storm occur, then it can cause desmosomal uh, disruption. And what that means, I had to look up desmosomes, it's been a while, but desmosomes mainly is the tissue that holds the cells together. So as desmosomal disruption occurs, the cells become more spaced out, um, and then that in and of itself can lead to arrhythmias. Uh, and then finally, if you have scar that can occur from myocarditis, that in and of itself can cause ventricular arrhythmias, and I'll actually show you some MRIs of that in a minute. So some of the lab markers, again, these are pretty obvious, but, but nonetheless are important to, to mention. Um, troponin IRT, uh, occurs in 90 to 95% of patients. Interestingly, in the registries that I found, uh, and again, there's not a lot of data on COVID-19 myocarditis, but the, the troponin levels are lower than the standard myocarditis cases that you'd see. This is run-of-the-mill viral, viral myocarditis like from uh, other, other things. Uh, so troponin levels are lower, and I'll explain that in more detail why that is. You can have increased BNP levels, of course your inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, SED rates, lactase levels, uh, your transaminases can be elevated, and then IL-6, which we'll talk about in a little more detail uh, later as well. Other diagnostic tools that we use, of course, we'll you know, almost always have an echo for concerned about myocarditis. Um, 
in one series about 60% had reduced ejection fraction, but uh, interestingly had cardiac tamponade and 20%. And again, Dr. Hanna mentioned that a lot of times it's a sterile effusion, but nonetheless it can cause things as, as, disruptive, as, as disruptive as a, a tamponade event. This is interesting, and this kind of looks into the real, the real pathophysiology of what's going on behind the scenes on CMR, which kind of gives you a little clue as to what's going on on the cellular level. You'll see diffuse uh, myocardial edema, but without any of the late gadolin gadolinium enhancement, which we will see oftentimes in people with other types of myocarditis, but you don't see that with COVID myocarditis. So the differential diagnosis, somebody that comes in with symptoms that may be consistent with COVID myocarditis, just general acute coronary syndromes may or may not be associated, may be a separate phenomenon, a type two myocardial infarction, which is usually stress induced from hypoxemia. Uh, you can have a separate issue where you have sep sepsis related cardiomyopathy. Typically those people resolve within seven to 10 days and then Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is in and of itself its own uh, another uh, causative factor. Um, so this is really getting into the guts of it and this is what I'm really quite interested in is understanding what's going on behind the scenes causing this. So as we alluded to earlier, you can have direct injury, the virus can attack the myocardium straight away um, and they can do that via the ACE2 receptor, which I'll show you a slide of that in a minute. You can have an autoimmune mediated process, so your body's literally attacking itself once it gets into that mode. And then finally, um, an immune mediated uh, injury. And this seems to be the most common source of, uh, of myocardial injury, and I'll show you that in, in a minute as well. But there's three ways that COVID myocarditis can occur. So this slide's really busy. Um, and I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time. I just want to sh uh, share three things with you on it. Uh, first, you've got the notorious spike protein, which go back. Um, and that spike protein attaches to the ACE receptor in the cardiomyocyte. And so that in and of itself causes the direct injury that we mentioned a minute ago. However, once that happens, then there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that then flow downstream, one of which is the development of uh, T cell activation and then things like IL-6. And so uh, IL-6 then can, can uh, cause all kinds of uh, problems, but one of which is the inflammation that we see, the edema. And that's, that's what we'll you know, be, be focusing a little more on later in the talk. Um, and this is mainly to show you that there's some other, uh, or the, all the organs that have, uh, that express the ACE2 uh, receptor. So, when you look in people with COVID, you can see how uh, it can be really a, a, a pro-inflammatory effect in a lot of different organ systems, the lungs, the kidneys, the brain, the heart, the blood vessels, and then also in the colon, uh, in, the, in the gut. Um, so, so this kind of then speaks to, well, as we're building on the in inflammation piece of it, um, how you can look on a TTE and somebody with COVID and potentially differentiate that from a standard run of the mill cardiomyopathy that may be acute in nature. So what we're seeing, and then again, this is somewhat subjective because there's not a lot of data on this, uh, but the wall thickness will be acutely changing. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Um, um, and that, that's basically the desmosomal disruption, the, the interstitium becomes basically edematous. The LV and RV chambers will dilate acutely. You can have pericardial effusions, and then, of course, the ejection fraction can be depressed on either side of your heart. And so, the the top two slides are a coronary, angi coronary angiogram, which most of the times when people come in with uh, heart failure-like symptoms, uh, this may cause troponin elevation. So you do a cath, and you know, the coronaries most of the time will be fairly normal, which is what we see. However, I hope this cursor doesn't cause this. I'm trying to focus on this. If you look, and this is a parasternal long axis view, and this is, doesn't move, but the point is, this is a very thickened and, and edematous myocardium. Uh, you can see it in a couple of views. Can't see it as well in terms of here, but you see the endocardium there, but it's very edematous. Um, and th that's, that's the hallmark of somebody that, that's having uh, the throes of a, a COVID myocarditis. 
Um, so that then leads us to another imaging uh, modality, which is cardiac MR or CMR. Um, so again, the diffuse myocardial edema is what we see. Um, you will see segmental wall motion abnormalities because unfortunately with the edema, sometimes it can lay down scar tissue and cause a wall motion abnormality in one particular area. Then you can have pericardial effusion. And then interestingly, and this is where it gets, gets really interesting on a cellular level, is um, the lower LGE, um, which is late gadolinium enhancement, is, uh, it's, it's much lower in this condition than it is in other forms of myocarditis uh, because of the fact that it uh, works more in an immune-mediated process as opposed to a direct injury. So in this kind of, just to kind of uh, dovetail what I just said, the lower LGE suggests a diffuse inflammatory process instead of a myocyte necrosis. So remember I mentioned earlier that in standard run-of-the-mill uh, myocarditis, troponin levels will be extraordinarily high. And troponin simply means that there's myocyte necrosis. Well, in COVID myocarditis, there's not a lot of myocyte necrosis. So troponin levels will actually not be nearly as high by maybe up a hundredfold, uh, quite low uh, in comparison. Um, and then there were eight confirmed cases from Germany, all of which showed uh, myocardial edema and patchy scarring of the myocardium. So the point is, it doesn't lay down a lot of dead tissue, but it simply causes inflammation. So that leads to the fact that why is the inflammation occurring? So it can be in a, a systemic immune response. Again, you can have direct myocardial damage or you can have vascular leakage from the epicardium causing endothelial damage, and then that in and of itself can cause almost abnormality. So there's lots of reasons. And I, first of all, there's a huge disclaimer here. I am no radiologist, and I did, did the best with my radiology friends to kind of look at these, but this is a cardiac MR here. Hopefully this cursor will not flip on me, but I'm trying to make it real simple here. This intense intensity here is, is sorry, this, I knew it was going to do it. Um, where it's somewhat white in the apex of the myocardium is, is the, the real source of inflammation. Um, and this is actually a patient here at Princeton that had uh, COVID myocarditis. And you can see where the arrows are. The white is the scar, okay? So there's only a small amount of scar tissue. When you see somebody that's had a big transmural myocardial infarction, say from a standard LAD occlusion or something like that, this whole area where those arrows is, is all white and covered in. And so that's not what we see. So this speaks to really what's going on on the cellular level in that we don't see myocyte necrosis and troponin elevation like I mentioned earlier. Instead, you see the edema. So as all of this took place, there were a lot of athletes that were being screened and I mentioned earlier about the Major League Baseball player and say, hey, gosh, we know, what do we do with all this? We're really worried. You know, a lot of these athletes are getting positive tests, but they're pretty asymptomatic. Are they at risk for myocarditis and then um, potentially sudden cardiac death, which is another thing that Dr. Hanna mentioned earlier. So Vanderbilt did a nice little study where they took 60 patients um, that were athletes um, at Vanderbilt that had COVID but had mild symptoms or even no symptoms. And they compared it to 59 athletes who had, they were COVID negative. Uh, and they only found a 3% incidence of myocarditis in the COVID positive patients and zero in the COVID negative. So original data from Ohio State uh, came out, I guess it was in March or April of last year when, all, when COVID really became uh, a pandemic. And they suggested that up to 15% of all the athletes screened were, uh, post COVID had myocarditis. Um, so this is what's sort of stemmed this study to say, hey, is that really the case? Again, if you remember back earlier, I mentioned in over 200 patients with COVID at necropsy, they found that only 4.5% had um, uh, myocarditis on, on uh, biopsy. So uh, initial studies and all the fear-based factors that we were dealing with, we just didn't know the, the numbers were much higher than really what is now being seen in, in what was a really good study here at Vanderbilt that they, they, they found this. So um, yeah, just to kind of go back on some of the things we talked about earlier, there were 14 cases of COVID myocarditis that were confirmed um, in Europe by CMR. 
as I mentioned earlier, about 50, uh, 50 to 60 percent were male. Um, earlier, uh, the, the mean age was 50 years. Over 50 percent had no comorbid conditions. And interestingly, so this is a you know middle-aged man with no medical problems. Again, that's me. <laughs> who shows up in shock and you know troponin elevation up to 91 percent um, and over 60 percent the ejection fraction was reduced two in ten had a cardiac tamponade but here's the good news is that 81 percent survived to discharge and I'll speak to that in a minute about why I think that that, that actually happens um, after you have your original symptoms four to seven days um, after you have your original COVID symptoms is when myocarditis may occur, at least in this series. Um, so before we go back to that, so, so one of the things that I believe plays a part in the survival, and this is purely um, after doing some research on my own, looking over this, is that the edema that's there, just like is in your lungs, is in your kidney, is in your brain, all the places in your body, eventually goes away. Um, over time, uh, not always, but eventually does. Whereas if you lay down scar and myonecrosis, which we don't see in COVID myocarditis, that's lasting, you can't replace that tissue. But thank goodness in this case, you don't see a lot of myonecrosis, so you don't see a lot of dead tissue to, to be speaking plainly about it. So that's why, and I'm purely making a guess here that, that people have a decent survival compared to standard uh, myocarditis from other causes. So the management of, of COVID myocarditis, um, there's no magic here. We don't have any silver bullet, uh, but supportive care, um, IV steroids, and that's kind of a hot topic. Um, uh, and so in standard myocarditis that's non-COVID related, steroids are typically a no-no except for a condition called giant cell myocarditis. So um, usually it's not, not um, uh, advocated to be used so but a lot of times people do use steroids in COVID uh, because it's used for COVID pneumonitis and things like that. Um, I mentioned on the slide earlier about IL-6 about how much of a bad player it is um, and so uh, there's no data on the use of the inhibitors of IL-6 but um, uh, it's something that clearly needs to be studied further. Uh, convalescent plasma uh, remdesivir, um, and people that have significant bradyarrhythmias, temporary pacing, and then of course mechanical support with uh, ECMO, impella, and intraortic balloon pump. This slide kind of enhances what I just talked about earlier um, with supportive care um, and things like that. Interestingly, one thing I want to direct your attention to is about ACE inhibitors. Originally, it was brought up uh, that ACE inhibitors may actually cause or potentially make you at risk for COVID, and now that's been borne out not to be the case. So we still would use standard guideline-directed therapy for heart failure, just as if they were a non-COVID patient. Um, so, and that's important. Um, this is kind of a busy slide. I'm not much of a menu person in terms of taking care of patients. I like to take care of the patient and then use data to, 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 to help me guide my decisions. But nonetheless, this kind of gives you some ideas. If you suspect somebody with COVID myocarditis, um, these are some of the symptoms you may have, um, bedside tests, um, and handheld, I will say this just to, to speak briefly, handheld ultrasounds are commonly being used in ICUs, the intensivists are using it, they're great. Um, they just give you a quick little assessment of do they have a big pericardial fusion, what's their ejection fraction. Obviously it's not going to tell you about piezo, the mitral valve, or things like that, but it gives you good basic information for, for making an assessment. So. I think that's something that we'll see more and more in ICUs as a handheld ultrasound. Um, and then your differential diagnosis, you know, do they have an acute coronary syndrome? Is this a sepsis-related cardiomyopathy, which is separate, or is it straight myocarditis from this, or is there a Takasubo going on? Um, and then in terms of investigations, uh, echo, um, CMR, um, and then CTA sometimes is helpful. Um, as a comment, um, cardiac MR is, is, uh, is something that we don't do a lot of in acutely ill patients because uh, a lot of times these people cannot be transported for various reasons. They may be on a ventilator and you just can't do a MRI with all the magnets. And uh, then also there's a whole issue about sterilization and all that. So 
but CMR is something that definitely is is useful in the situation. But but um, usually you want patients a little more stable before you go and assess. Um, so in management um, is you know, try not to knock down their heart rate if that's what they're dependent on to get cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So if you drop their heart rate, you can drop their cardiac output. So be careful about not being overzealous about making their heart rate above uh, less than 100 or something like that. Uh, watch your NSAIDs, um, and then you know a heart failure or cardiogenic shock. Um, then I mentioned earlier about um, blocking the IL-6 pathway uh, with these drugs. Uh, and then of course, if there's any bradyarrhythmias, uh, and then um, you know, potentially using, interestingly, they mention here ventricular arrhythmias, lidocaine and mexiltine, but they don't mention amiodarone. The point being, that amiodarone has a lot of drug interactions with some of the drugs that are commonly used, one of which is azithromycin. Um, so be aware of that. And then, of course, QT prolongation, which is what we kind of talked about. Um, this is another little kind of pathway you can look at. Um, so um, kind of the same things we've already talked about. So last slide. I'm sure y'all are tired and wet and ready to get over with. This is kind of the, uh, the, the, the how I, when I was in school, we used to use cliff notes. So my English teacher's watching now, forgive me, I used them. So, um, but the key takeaways, so it's not as common as we first thought, thank goodness, uh, but it is there and it's something to be aware of. Um, it, uh, and this is purely for COVID myocarditis. It commonly affects relatively healthy uh, middle-aged men the good news is that in the largest series I could find, an 81% survival was noted. Um, this is where you have to, to be a clinician and, and, and pe people that have COVID um, but have heart failure symptoms to be suspicious. Um, and then uh, another thing to mention is about the fact that it's an immune mediated process um, instead of it, um, is that still on? Okay, okay. Um, and so it's an immune mediated process and it doesn't cause a lot of myonecrosis, which again is, I think, one of the reasons that people uh, have a decent survival. And then the biggest thing is subclinical myocarditis underdiagnosed. So, you know, I'm in the trenches every day seeing patients on consults, and, you know, we get called to see a patient because their troponin may be minimally high and their BNP may be, you know, 420 or something like that. What do you do with those patients? Uh, and you do an echo and their EF is you know, 45 or 50 percent, do these people have myocarditis? I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, but it, it suffice it to say that it, it's, it's probably there a lot more than we realize um, uh, based on how, how the mechanism is and uh, you know, about how they can infect the myocardium via um, immune-mediated processes. Um, but that's, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Today is my privilege to bring a brief summary of the lectures you've just heard on COVID-19 and myocarditis. Myocarditis is a recognized complication of COVID-19, thankfully uh, not as frequent as was originally thought when uh, COVID-19 uh, first emerged. Uh, in the early days, it was thought that perhaps 20% or so of patients with COVID-19 uh, would contract myocarditis. It looks like four to five percent uh, is the number that we see. The myocarditis is caused by a lymphocytic infiltration of the myocardium and is seen uh, at higher rates in men than women, uh, in middle-aged to older patients, more than younger patients, thank goodness, uh, and more commonly in those patients who have a history of hypertension. The lab markers that can be seen in patients with myocarditis as a complication of COVID-19 include increased troponin levels, increased BNP levels, and an increase in the C-reactive protein and sedimentation rates in these patients. As you heard in the presentation, uh, the management is basically supportive, uh, controversial whether IV steroids are useful in the management of patients with acute myocarditis as a complication of COVID-19, and of course, uh, all of the treatment regimens that are available for the treatment of COVID-19 should be used in the patients 
with COVID-19. Thankfully, the survival rate is good, uh, better than in some complications of COVID-19. Uh, more than 80% of patients with myocarditis as a complication will survive their illness. So I hope this brief summary has been useful to you as you continue to take care of your patients with myocarditis and COVID-19. And thank you for your attention and our best wishes to you. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Dr. Charlie Sands and I serve as Chair of MedEd Global's Advisory Board. As an international medical education service provider, MedEd Global is excited to have provided this outstanding review of the cardiovascular complications of COVID. Our mission is to promote superior education and training for international healthcare personnel. I sincerely hope that this educational video has proven to be of help to you and your colleagues. If you'd like to discuss ways in which you can support or become a part of MedEd Global, our contact information will appear on the screen momentarily. Thank you for the opportunity to share this important information on the cardiovascular complications of COVID.